Well, that's really something to have that happen over and over. In some ways, you might think, well, how could anything better possibly happen to you than to have people come up to you all over the world, strangers, and open themselves up like that, like their old friends, so quickly. But at the same po time, it's an awful thing. Because you see, even in the revelation of their triumph, the initial depth of their despair. So I wouldn't change that. But it's not nothing. And it's certainly not just happiness. It's better than happiness, but it's almost unbearable. What I was going to ask you that question. Aim to be good and pray for happiness. So the question I was going to, it was pretty much that is, what is a better question for me to ask mm -hmm. you if I'm checking in on you? Because we ask that question with good intentions. Mm -hmm. Are you happy? What's a better question for me to ask Jordan Peterson? How are you doing? How are you doing? Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Brilliantly and terribly. You know, when you listen to a profound piece of music, one that sort of spans the whole emotional experience, it's not happy. Happy is elevator music, and probably you just shouldn't listen to that at all. Right? And, and you think, why? Well, it, it, it's harmless, it's treacly, it's sweet. Uh, it's simple, it lacks depth, it's shallow, that's a problem. Um, it doesn't have that deep sense of awe and horror, I would say, that is characteristic of the best of all music. You know, you listen to some mis simple music, so-called. Hank Williams is a good example. You know, the blues cowboy from the 50s who died of alcoholism when he was 27 and whose voice sounds like an 80-year-old man. Simple melody, you know, but there's nothing simple in the song and, and in the voice. It's deep, you know, it's like the blues. It's, it's like black blues in the States from the 20s, and it was certainly influenced by that tradition. There's this admission of a deep suffering at the same time as you get the beautiful transcendence of the music. And that's meaning, you know, that's awful in the most fundamental sense, but you need an antidote to suffering and it has to be deep. And you know, deep moves you tectonically and it's not a trivial thing. And, but that's better than happiness. And maybe if you're lucky while you're pursuing that and while you're immersed in it, you get to be happy and, and you should fall on your knees and be grateful for that when it happens. You know, it's a gift. It really is a gift. And it comes upon you unexpectedly, your happiness, you know. But you aim to climb uphill to the highest peak you can possibly envision. And that's, that's better than happiness. It isn't certain how the future is going to lay itself out. And it isn't certain that what you knew in the past is going to be sufficient for you to, to move forward into the future. So there's lots of opportunity, but it's very complex. And it's not easy to keep up in our world. <coughs> You know, like if you look around the world, you might think, well, the happiest people are those where the high, standard of living is the highest. That's actually not the case. Right. And you think, okay, but why wouldn't that be the case? It's like, you want what do you want? Malaria and death at 40? Obviously not. But then you think, okay, what's the price you pay for a high standard of living? Well, that's easy. You virtually always sacrifice the present for the future. You're always mm -hmm. working. I mean, you guys, you know, I mean you know, you've, you're fairly influential and you've got this good thing going, but like it could crash at a moment's notice. You better keep your eye on it. And, and, and every day you're thinking, okay, this has to be done and this has to be done and this has to be done. And it's so it pays off. I mean, you have a nice studio and, and, and I would presume a reasonably comfortable life, mm -hmm. but it's not like you're not running on a treadmill to keep that going. And so that's, that's security and it's health but it isn't necessarily happiness, and it's certainly not necessarily freedom from anxiety. And I would say most people in the modern world, weirdly enough, have far too much to do. You know, two career families and a couple of kids, it's like, man, you're, you're done. That's 60 hours a week of flat out work. So, and that can be too much. And then I also think because our society is philosophically unstable and that's sort of reflected in this polarization is that people are doubtful about whether their lives have any meaning for mm -hmm. example you know well, what's why bother what's the use of it who cares it's like 
what difference is it going to make in a million years, you know? And that's, life is hard. And if you just have a nihilistic viewpoint, then it's easy to be swamped by doubts and, and existential angst and all of that. And, and like, I think that's a mistake because I think that your life, your life can be very meaningful. It's proportionate to the responsibility that you take on. And mm-hmm. you can learn that by watching when you're engaged in the world, you know, and, and what works to sort of protect you from feelings of isolation and doom. So, so I think part of it is the complexity of the modern world. Yeah. I also can't shake the sneaking suspicion that it has something to do with our diet. Really? Well, you know, I saw this, we know that obesity is like skyrocketing. Yeah. Okay. So, and probably the reason for that, it's not exactly certain. There might be complicated reasons for it, but certainly one of the reasons is that people eat far too many carbohydrates. Right. You know, I saw this video from World War II um, about, about and, and in, in one of the scenes, they showed all these men in New York lining up to be inducted. And it's like, you know, 20 blocks of guys with no shirts on mm-hmm. standing in line to be inducted. Every single one of them was... <laughs> Bone thin. Do you every think, single do you think one. it's the insecurity and the negative feelings that come with being overweight or the actual no, food? No, no, no. I think there's something wrong with what we're eating. Mm. Interesting. And yeah, I mean, there's more and more evidence that dietary sensitivity, for example, is linked to conditions like schizophrenia. Really? And so, yes. Watch yes. out for that bread, y'all. Well, and also, your gut bacteria turns out, which you have a lot of, you have about 100 times more bacterial cells in your body than human cells. Mm which is really quite a freaky thing to think about. Luckily, they're quite tiny, because yes. otherwise you'd be like a giant amoeba, yes. you know. But the, the gut biome produces a lot of neurochemicals, and so it does play an integral role in the regulation of your mood, mm. which is also a very strange thing. One possibility is that, well, let's say you eat a lot of carbohydrates and sugar. Okay, so what happens is that you grow bacteria in your gut that right. really like carbohydrates and sugar. Right. Well, so then you think, well, I'm always having cravings for carbohydrates and sugar. It's mm-hmm. like, you're having the cravings, you think. Well, maybe not. Maybe what's happened is that, you know, through a Darwinian process, you've encouraged the growth of bacteria sure. that really like sugar and right. carbohydrates. And you think and that same bacteria is messing with people's mood, maybe. Yes, it could, and it's also messing with their cravings. That's. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're really walking oceans, you know, like we're big creatures. Yeah. I mean, we're not big compared to a, like a Douglas fir or, or, or the sun, yeah, but like yeah, sure. we're pretty big creatures and, yeah. and we are liquid. Most of us is liquid. Yeah. And, you know, if you saturate yourself with carbohydrates and sugar, then you, mm. you are invaded by the bacteria that live on those things. Mm. And so that's not necessarily so good for you.